Good morning, everyone. Is it okay if we start a little bit early? All right, everybody seated and ready for this big occasion. And I want to say welcome to everyone. And I would first like to welcome our guest speaker, Professor Flavia Senkobuge, who came all the way for the special occasion. Thank you very much for traveling to Becha. Um, and I'd like to welcome our Executive Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, Prof. Sengela. And then our medical school staff, who have done an amazing job Yo, to get the ship out of the harbor. And we have survived the first term. So thank you to all our staff. And then, <laughs> welcome to our sponsors from APSA, Terence Pele, Faraz Ghani, Pumza Kayingana, and Andy De La Mar, De La Mer. Um, welcome. And then the most important guests today are our students. So welcome to all of you. So why are we here today? We are here because we have a dream. We want to produce Mandela doctors for the Eastern Cape and for the country. And yeah, you, you've heard about the Mandela doctor and you'll still hear a lot about it as, as, as we go along. We want Mandela doctors who will be caring and competent generalists who are fit for purpose. And our faculty vision is to co-create critical thinking health science graduates with transformative action, we change the world by being in service of society. So we want in 20, what year are you graduating? 2029. Oh, and six years from now. So when you, when you graduate, we want you to go and change the world. And in your journey of professional identity formation, there are certain landmarks. And, and rituals, and this is one of them, where we remind ourselves of why we chose this career of going into medicine in service of society to, to change the world. And that's why we will focus on the oath today. So when we have important gatherings, we often open with a prayer, but we've got people from lots of different faith traditions here. So could you please stand for a moment of silence? We can close our eyes and have a moment of silence to mark this occasion. Thank you, you may be seated. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Prof. Singela, who is our Executive Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences. She's a psychiatrist and she's also recently completed a PhD and she will introduce our guest speaker. Good morning, everyone. Can I get a show of hands? Who of you was not at the orientation when we first met? Looks like it was most of you. Okay. So. For those who do not know me, um, I am Executive Dean, as um, Prof. De Vries has indicated. And more importantly, because this is one of the three schools in the Faculty of Health Sciences, I'm no guest. I'm part of you. So that's very important to remember because what is nice about our faculty is as much as we have three schools, we are all focused on health sciences. So today is a, a very wonderful day and I expect to see big smiles on your faces because out of thousands of applicants, we chose you and out of 10 medical schools, you chose us. So we chose each other and therefore we are stuck with each other for a minimum of six years. I'm hoping every single one in this room that six years will apply because if it does apply, it means at no point did you trip, isn't it? And our intention is to get to the finish line. So I'm not going to give a long speech because we've got a special guest in front of us. This is Prof. Um, Flavia Sekumboke, who is from University of Pretoria. 
and I have a short bio to read about who she is and why we chose her to um, form this very important uh, day. Um, because remember, this memory is going to last you a lifetime, especially because we're going to have pictures that are taken and you can share wherever and whenever. And uh, therefore, even when you've forgotten the contents of the day, the photo will remind you. So before I read um, Prof. Segumboge's uh, uh, biography, I'd like us to focus on a, a couple of things. So first of all, when you read the oath today, you may not necessarily understand its true meaning. But as you move from first year, second year, up until sixth year, as you move into internship, maybe community service if it still exists, as you move into your career, as you specialize, the oath will come back to haunt you day in, day out, time and time again. And at times when you're not sure what to do, at times when you doubt, always remember the principles of the oath you are taking today. Because unlike other careers, you are in a career that is in service of your community. And whether you define your community as your neighbors around you, as your mate sitting next to you, or as, um, you know, the region you're from, the province you're from, the country you're from, we are all part of a health service, um, you know, conglomeration of skills that are there to look after the needs of the nation. And when we're talking needs, I know the assumption when you go through medical school is, okay, assess, find an illness, diagnose, and treat. And we forget about the preventative aspect. So the program that you have joined has got a lot of emphasis on the preventative aspects for that reason, because we know that, I mean, you've heard it many times, prevention is better than cure. So what I'd like you to do as you read your oath, First of all, remember where you come from and what pushed you to apply into this particular institution. There could be many reasons, but keep those in mind. Secondly, also keep your goal in mind and never lose sight of your goal. And then the other thing that you have to do is you look at yourself, where you come from, where you are, and then you ask yourself this. What is the one thing that inspires you to continue when things are difficult? And keep that in mind as your compass. Also try and think, what is the one thing that you need to do more of to make a success of your medical care career? Could be, you know, take better care of yourself, sleep more, read this or that more, or study this or that more but make it one major thing that you think will change your trajectory. And then lastly, what is the one thing that you could do less of to increase or enhance the chances of you succeeding? And I'm doing this because often when you get into your medical studies, you become incredibly busy. You become so busy that you think you don't have time for friends, you don't have time for fun. And unfortunately, when you do that to yourself, you neglect certain parts of yourself. Because believe you me, the person you are today is not going to be the same person who leaves these doors at the end of six years. So as much as you will be growing in terms of your knowledge, in terms of your um, uh, capabilities, in terms of your medical skills, you're also growing as a person. And I always like to remind people, as you're sitting here, in this very group, take time to look around because you might find that your life partner is also sitting here somewhere. <laughs> and I can see some were already picking life partners. <laughs> and that's not a joke uh, because many people find each other in the medical program and it's highly um, common to find that, you know, they first met in, in, in the first year of medical school. And I'm pointing that out because some of you will be best friends for life as well. So this is an environment that allows you to grow in terms of your academic skills, 
but also in terms of your personal skills. So you need to make the most of it. Okay. So now on to our special guest. So Prof. Flavia Sekumboge is a medical doctor, a public health medicine specialist, and a global public health advocate. Underline global. That's why I said your community can be anywhere. She is also the deputy dean um, of stakeholder relations of the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Pretoria. She is the immediate past president of the Colleges of Medicine of South Africa. For those who don't know what a CMSA is, that is the college that is responsible for administering the uh, exams that you write when you study to become a specialist. Um, the CMSA is, of course, the apex body of medicine in South Africa, as I explained, and it is also one of the most prestigious um, bodies of medicine on the African continent. She's the current chair of the WHO Afro Region African Advisory Council on Research and Development. This is concerned with advising the WHO Regional Director on matters concerning health research and development in Africa. She's the president of Women in Global Health South Africa. This is a global movement with chapters across the globe that is concerned with achieving gender equality when glo with, uh, within global um, health leadership. She's the vice president of the African Federation of Public Health Association. This is an organization concerned with advocating and promoting public health in Africa. Prof. Sekumboge is also the recipient of the prestigious Kofi Annan Fellowship in Public Health Leadership and also was recently recognized by the Harvard Public Health as one of the 25 standout voices in African public health. So we don't play when we invite special guests, hey? <laughs> so at heart, she is a philanthropist and is passionate about mentoring the next generation of leaders. And of course, you are the next generation. So remember this as I hand over to Prof. Asakumboge. We talk about changing the world. And you did hear that there's an expectation that when you qualify, you're going to change the world. I don't expect us to wait until you qualify. You can change the world where you are here today. How? If you make sure that your relationship and engagement with the people around you, if you do a 360 degrees, is an engagement that is enriching both to you and to them, you're really changing the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, my dear friend, Prof. Zuki Zingela. And I also want to recognize um, Prof. Alma de Vries. And I want to recognize uh, all the staff members who are here today um, and also your friends if they are somewhere here. And I'll be in trouble because Zuki is my friend and we do um, walk around looking for sponsorship everywhere. So I will um, recognize very much with a great smile the sponsors um, from APSA as well. And Alma did um, assist me in, um, you know, just recognizing everybody. So in our typical South African way, I'll say all protocol observed. I just cannot tell you what a joy it is for me to be here this afternoon in a place that I always say holds my heart. It will always be my home, my beautiful Eastern Cape province. And Prof. Zingela, I really do have to say that um, thank you for this generous invitation to you and your team. And honestly, I cannot tell you how honored and humbled I am to be here, to be speaking to this amazing and beautiful, beautiful uh, group of uh, medical students. I, I must say, I was taken aback when Prof. Zingela said to me that you are first year students, because typically the oath happens when you are finishing. And I just think that it is so special for you to commit yourselves in first year, and I hope that the other medical schools will be able to take this example, Prof. Zingela, and really also ensure that our first years also commit themselves. As I told you, I am a daughter of this province and growing up in this beautiful province, really from everything that you've heard Prof. Zingela say about me, this province has made me who I am today. 
And so to you, our medical students, I say our because uh, although I come from the University of Pretoria, really we are part of the greater ecosystem and the greater health system. So you belong to all of us. And so you are really receiving, and I say this with great seriousness, you're receiving your medical training in the best environment. You're receiving your medical training in the best province, which is a place of warmth, where there is heart, and where there is soul. And I tell you, when you grow up a little bit more, you will realize how important it is to groom and grow in environments that nurture you and recognize you as a full human being, not just as a medical student. I do have to say to you that please hold on to your values. Though the values that embody this province are in fact in the motto of the friendly province. And a lot of this, in fact, you have been taught all these values of kindness and compassion from home. Don't forget those particular values of compassion, of love, of being friendly. No matter how the road ends up and winds and becomes harder, I want to ask you to stay steadfast. Stay steadfast and remember, remember that you are training in the home of legends. You really are. This place that you have chosen to be your medical school has really seen people lead, not only nationally, but internationally as well, and also in our region. The people who come from this province have shaken ground. And so you find yourself in the place that really will nurture you and that embodies and has had people who are giants walk on the same soil that you are going to be walking on for six years. There is a beautiful, well-known hymn, not only just in our province, but actually I've come to realize in my moving around the country, it's also known, um, in fact, even nationally as well. And it was composed by a great son of this province. Uh, and many of you may know the Sogas, um, and the person was Reverend Dio Soga. He was one of the first major African intellectuals. He composed this song in the 19th century, and the title of the song was Lizalisa Itingalako, which means fulfill your promise. And the reason why I chose this particular song in terms of borrowing from the song and the title of my speech today is unapologetically Liza Lisa Itingalako, which means fulfill your promise. Um, and it's because today, as much as we're calling it an oath, you really are on a journey to fulfilling your promise. And I'll take you through a journey of what this promise is. Because you see, we live in a world where so many are consistently becoming quite disillusioned about so much. There's so much to be disillusioned about around us, the devastation and everything else that is there. More so we are disillusioned in humanity. And yet in the midst of it all, the experiences of love, the experiences of compassion still exists. And so, in essence, an oath is one of those moments and experiences in our existence that remains quite sacred, as Prof. Zingela has said. And Brian S. Woods talks about the sacredness of the word and also the sacredness of the world. And he says that the sacredness of the world is that it is pursued and it has pursued the light. And so in each one of you, as you sit here today, you are a symbolic representation 
of the pursuit of light, the light of healing, the light of health, the light of restoration, the light of well-being. And you will see it once you start going and seeing patients that, in fact, a lot of them, when you walk in and they see you in your beautiful white coats, they will light up. That's why I say you are an embodiment of this pursuit of light. And so when people ask you, why are you in your profession um, having to take an oath? You need to just hear the story that I'm going to tell you a little bit. And that is that, first of all, many of you, as you sit here today, you will start to craft your story. And your stories, many of you, are going to be stories of overcoming challenges, of fighting hard, of going through junior school, high school, the process of application, and then finally the selection, and here you are today. And in that selection, in that selection, don't ever forget that you are one of the select few. There's so many people who apply. I just look at our own medical school. We get about 5,000 applications and we can only take 200. That means something. In all of that, your challenges are not going to end. And in front of you lie enormous challenges as well. And there will be moments of joy. There'll be moments of sadness. You may doubt yourself and question whether this is really what you want to do. And I can tell you, everybody who is sitting here, the adults, I'm looking at them, myself included, I have wondered whether is this what I really want to do. And I wondered it from first year, second year, third year, fourth year. And I still remember, I like to tell the stories to my mentees. And I say to them, I still remember quite vividly in fourth year calling my parents and saying to them, in any case, I wanted to study drama and I got selected into medical school. So I think if I phone Julia to New York, they'll still take me because I was the best dramatic act in the country at that time because we had this competition called Daro, the adults may still remember. And I was part of that competition and that's where I got a scholarship to go to New York to study drama. And I, you know... I don't know, but the adults will know. When you're making crazy decisions, you are so calm. I was so calm. I packed everything. It was a blessing that my parents came from Queenstown in the Eastern Cape, and some of you may know where Queenstown is. And my mom, in her wisdom, she said, no problem, honey. We will fetch you in a month's time. I said, oh, a month, okay, no problem. I've been doing this for four years. A month is okay. And I was so calm, packed everything. And I used to tell my classmates, oh, no, I'm quitting. I'm leaving. I'm going to pursue drama. You know, people are a kaleidoscope. I am not just doctor. I am a multiple of colors. And I still remember we have a training hospital called Galafong Hospital. And at that hospital, there's a little grass patch and there was a, uh, um, a classmate of mine. Her name is Adele. I always tell Adele, I owe you my medical degree. And I went to Adele. I said to her, oh, by the way, I'm leaving. And she said to me, why are you leaving? I said, oh, no, I'm not coping. And you know what? I'm not about this life of not coping. And then she, the, I was straight A's. I was my trick of the year in the Eastern Cape. I mean, no, uh-uh. And she said to me, oh, well, I'm not coping either. I said, you aren't? She said, yeah, <laughs> half of us aren't coping. We just getting by and putting one foot in front of another. That evening, I went back, phoned my mother, and I said to her, mm, you know about that thing which I said about you coming home? I think I want to stay just a little bit longer. <laughs> and that's what happened. And, and that's why Prof. Singela is saying to you, please, take care of each other. 
my own classmate saved me just by saying, I recognize you. I too am going through what you are going through. And so there will be those moments of doubt. There will be those moments where you say, I need to go. But the reality is that you will make it. The fact that you are here, the fact that you are here means that you are going to finish and you're going to become a medical doctor. And that's a fact. Many of you, many, many people, and I know now you are the first years, we've got the second years and, and the third years. They've sat where you've sat, taking their oaths. But you also have people who are going to be sitting where you are sitting when you are long gone. And the commonality between you who is sitting here, the people who sat before you and the ones who are going to come after you, is the fact that you all share one thing that binds you all together, and that is the commitment to uphold your profession at all costs, to execute your work with the utmost dignity, decorum, respect, and humility. And that is the oath that you're taking today. You are taking an oath of dignity, of decorum, of respect, and of humility. Because, and I want to repeat this again, as you sit here, you are not just a medical student. You are a doctor in training. And so, in essence, remember, doctors in training, that even before you qualify, as Prof. Zingela was saying, people will be entrusting their lives to you. They'll be entrusting the lives of their loved ones to you, their health and their wellness. And that's why it's so important today that you make that commitment that even as you begin your medical career, that you have a commitment to uphold that professionalism. Because for us in our profession, we're not like other professions. We take you by fourth year, you are already, before you even get DR in front of you, we entrust you with the lives of the most vulnerable people of our society. You know it yourself when you are sick, that that is the time when you are at your most vulnerable. And so the occasion today, though you may be excited, is a very, very solemn occasion. And so in essence, you're making a promise not only to yourself, your colleagues, you're making that promise to the most vulnerable of our society, and that's the patience and again, to treat them with dignity, honesty, and humility, no matter, no matter the circumstances. You also vowing and taking an oath to honor the gift. And I want to repeat that. You're taking a vow and an oath to honor the gift that you have been blessed with. What is this gift? The gift is a gift of you as a healer. Because sometimes we leave this definition of doctoring. Doctors are healers. That therefore means that you must never, ever bring harm to your patients. And so... Let today and the words that you are going to be saying be a guiding light um, for you. And so knowing that your profession is one of the very few professions where you, in fact, are required to take an oath. And so in the solemnness of this particular occasion, reflect on how far you've come. Reflect on the people who have sacrificed your parents, your guardians, who have sacrificed everything to make sure that you are sitting here today. And also 
reflecting and honoring the people who are here, who are going to be teaching you for six years. And I think my colleagues never ever hear this enough. The lecturers or the teachers who you call professors at the university, they sacrifice their family time, everything to ensure that you are successful. And they get most of the time, no thanks. Honor them, respect them, don't fear them, go to them. They will hold your hand because incidentally, they are the only people who know and have journeyed um, before you. So again, never ever take for granted the fact that you've been gifted this privilege to become a healer. And so, yes, you've worked very hard and don't forget to take a moment to really pat yourself on the back. You really deserve to be here. You are worthy. So many people talk about this imposter syndrome and I've, I always say to them, you cannot talk about imposter syndrome if already in the beginning of your journey, somebody says to you, you are worthy. And I want to repeat this. You are worthy. You belong here. You matter and you've earned your place. You will do well and you will finish. And in all you do, never lose your humility. Remain deeply humble. You will be recognized. And a lot of the times as a medical student already in the wards, you'll be recognized as somebody who is a leader, as somebody whose voice counts. Take that privilege with great humility. Respect your patience again because of that honor that you have been given, given. Never forget again who supported you and who held you down, especially as you grow, especially as you get your degrees. Never ever forget where you come from. Be kind to yourself, be kind to others, and make sure, again, it will be remiss of me to sit down without saying, take care of yourself. It's like an anthem. People always say, oh, when Flavia goes to speak, she's always telling people to take care of themselves. But the medical career of six years is grueling. And so take care of your physical health, take care of your mental health. And when you need to rest, don't be ashamed. Don't be apologetic about it. Rest. Yes, you are here to be a medical doctor, but when you graduate, as I always say, your mother, grandmother, grandfather, auntie, siblings should still recognize their child. And most importantly, when you look in the mirror, you should still be able to recognize yourself. Do not lose yourself and the beauty inside you in pursuit of a degree. Do not lose yourself in pursuit of a degree. And so allow me as I close to do what we do customarily in Africa and it is our tradition in Africa to close with an African blessing and say today as you take your oath and embark on a journey of commitment to serve, may harm never come to you. May you always walk under the anointment. May your hands always bear the miracle and the mystery of healing and the miracle of life. May you be blessed with the choicest gifts of the gods and the ancestors. May yours be the hand that is as blessed as the soil of the motherland. May your hand be as blessed as the shimmering gold of Africa. 
May you conquer mountains higher than Kilimanjaro. May yours be the voice for those who have no voice, those who had no voice, those who were never allowed to have a voice, and those who remain unseen, unheard, and unwanted. May you never forget that you are the embodiment of the prayers of your forefathers and your foremothers. They walk with you. They will always walk with you, guiding you, helping you, protecting you. May you be fearless, fearless in your pursuit of excellence and justice, knowing that you walk with the heart of a lion and a lioness. May you know that you walk not only in the footsteps of giants, but you walk on the soil that has nurtured and groomed great leaders, great legends. May you be brave. May you be brave knowing that you walk as sons and daughters of kings and queens, heroes and heroines who sacrificed, who conquered for you to take your place. Take your place boldly with humility. Take your place knowing that the conquering spirits raced with pride in you, is with you, and will always, always guide you. May you be all, all that you dream to be. Climb and reach higher, shine brighter than the brightest African star. May you always be blessed. May you always be favored. May you always be protected. May you always be anchored. May you always be, may you always be our answered prayer. I thank you. Thank you. For me, words almost fail me. <laughs> and, and it was a privilege to listen to that. Thank you. And it is now my honor to be able to lead you through the taking of your oaths. You should all have a copy in front of you. And so I'm going to um, ask you please to stand. And then I'll read sentence by sentence. And if you could read the sentence after me. And so we start. In the presence of family, friends, teachers and colleagues, and in the spirit of Hippocrates, I pledge to keep this oath. In the presence of family, friends, teachers and colleagues, and in the spirit of Hippocrates, I pledge to keep this oath. First, I will do no harm. First, I will do no harm. I will honour those who teach me the art and science of medicine. I will honour those who teach me the art and science of medicine. I will remember with gratitude and humility those whose illness or injury provided examples from which I learn, and in their honour I will continue the pursuit of knowledge. I will I will share my knowledge with future colleagues and all who are in want or need of it. I will share my knowledge with future colleagues and all who are in want or need of it. I will practice medicine with conscience and humility, and I will act with enduring respect for the dignity of human life. I will practice medicine with conscience and humility, and I will act with enduring respect. Foremost in my mind will be compassion, respect, and impartial care for my patients. Foremost in my mind will be compassion, respect, and impartial care for my patients. 
impartial care for my patients. I will hold sacred the trust of my patients and respect the secrets that they confide in me. I will hold sacred the trust of my patients and respect the secrets that they confide in me. I will not be swayed by greed, prejudice, or selfish ego in the practice of my art. I will not be swayed by greed, prejudice, or selfish ego in the practice of my art. Finally, I will do all in my power to help my patients reach physical, mental, and spiritual health, and I will strive for this balance in my own life. Finally, I will do all in my power to help my patients reach physical, mental, and spiritual health, and I will strive for this balance in my own life. May I have the courage and character to hold these principles sacred from this day forward, as I place myself into the service of humankind. May I have the courage and character to hold these principles sacred from this day forward, as I place myself into the service of humankind. This oath I make solemnly, freely, and upon my honor. This oath I make solemnly, freely, and upon my honor. Thank you. You may be seated. This is a very touching moment. We will now give a chance to um, Andy de la Mer to say a few words from APSA side. Thank you very much. Thank you. When I arrived outside, I met Sherwin uh, and he looked at me and he said, who's speaking from APSA this year? And I said, unfortunately, me again. Um, so I'm privileged it's my third uh, ceremony I've been able to attend. The last two I spoke at, so this, this year I, I've got some other colleagues. I thought, guys, maybe someone else, you know, maybe, uh, you know, one of your turn. They said, no, no, it's the third time. Hopefully by now you've got your speech right. So uh, <laughs> for those of you that have been here before, my apologies. Uh, so uh, Prof, uh, Prof Zingela, the leadership of Nelson Mandela University, uh, my colleagues from APSA, uh, parents, guests, and most importantly, the, the class of 2023, uh, Malwind. I'm not, I, I'm not here on my own. I've got some colleagues. So in the corner there, I've got Faraz Ghani, who's our youth and student specialist. Uh, and we've got our, our Pumza from Private Bank. And I've got Terence Pillay, who is our uh, head, regional head for what we call the Nelson Mandela and Koha area. So sort of Kabecha. Uh, Utenaik, uh, humans, or that, that sort of area. So he's a key person to know. So if the ATMs are broken, you just just phone him. That's what he's. Um, so it's indeed a, a privilege and an honor to be here once again. We have a, a long and a, a proud association with Nelson Mandela University, are covering very many different um, <coughs> excuse me uh, areas. We've partnered on a range of things, ranging from I think training pharmacists. Um, pharmacy assistance for rural clinics through to training entrepreneurs and more recently working around fees must fall. And I see just last year, uh, we gave over 800,000 rand to eliminate missing middle student debt. So it's great to be here today as well. Um, people often wanna know why, why do we do this? You know, do we insist that after today, everyone takes out a, an APSA account or, you know, or that, that the sponsorships, only the APSA clients are gonna get lunch, um, no. We, we realize that business and society are interlinked. There's an interdependency. Um, and one hand will wash, wash the other. So um, my, my friends laugh at me because I tried to do a bit of mountain biking. A while back, I took a tumble and one hand was out of action. All of a sudden, I got a new appreciation for, for this part of this idiom that says it's like a because the one hand was literally useless. And I realized this interdependency between business and society is real. So business cannot succeed in a failing society and vice versa. So it's important that we are supporting initiatives such as these and the entrepreneurship programs and other study programs that we've been doing. Um, we also realized when those of us who are getting close to retirement that we want good doctors to look after us in a couple of years time. So, um, we also realize that we can't do this sort of stuff on our own. Partnerships are so, so critical. And, and I mean, there are many 
partnership uh, authors that you can refer to. I particularly like someone called Simon Zadek, and he says, the world has become too complex and interdependent and resources too scarce for any one institution or sector to effectively respond to today's global challenges. Partnerships are a way of getting things done that individual organizations would not uh, do acting alone. So partnerships such as the one we have with NMU is something that we really do value at Epson. Um, so, so yeah, why else are we, yeah, well, we also are a financial services organization. So we believe that financial services need to be convenient. They often tell us that banking is a grudge purchase. If you ask anyone, I mean, hey, let's go and look, let's go shopping for clothes. Let's go and look at cars or, you know, new cars or something like people are there. Let's go to the bank. It's like, do I have to go? And we, we realize that. So we often ask ourselves, how can we make financial services more convenient and more accessible? So one of the things that we do, that we part of the external sales team is that we bring bank banking to you. So we understand you guys are busy with your studies. It's a demanding program. So for us and the team, they do on-site banking, so you'll often find them at, on the on the, on campus or where it raises, so you don't have to worry and sort of neglect your studies to go stand in the queue at a, at a bank. The guys come to you, touch base with us, and, and, and they come. Um, also, we've listened to students. Most organizations have a, a student account, and they vary. We had one a couple of years ago, and we couldn't figure out why there wasn't much uptake. And then we started asking students, so he has this account. Why, why aren't you guys you know taking it up why aren't you opening accounts and so on it was an account that had monthly fees and someone said but Dada, look this account of yours charges monthly we only get if we get money so when NS, nsfs pays out maybe every quarter or something like that there was some other feedback we got and we adapted the account accordingly so we have a zero rated student account there's no monthly fee it also comes with other perks that for us can tell you about like free data and discount on um on burgers, so I know you guys are all health students, so to be the healthy ones, not the not the greasy type. Um, and then also, you know, uh, um, the loans if you want to study further, or um, you know, sometimes people need to to top up. So it's all all the stuff that we do. We also do a lot of financial education. Now, I often talk about this topic because it's something I'm passionate about, and, and you'll hear people talk about IQ, you'll hear people talk about EQ, emotional intelligence. But you hear very little about something I call FinQ. And we find people with, and I think not with a PhD, ma'am. But we find even PhD graduates, and you look at their money. You know, um, and uh, so, so the fact that you study medicine doesn't mean that every area of your life is going to be, be perfect. I think in, you know, it's his position heal yourself. It, yeah, has um, pillies. Now, when it comes to finance, that's what we're here for. Uh, I won't tell you long stories about doctors, pharmacists, and and some of the in, in uh, not a psychiatrist at least, it was a psychologist, man, at least one of my clients, PhD in, in psychology, no help, but hey, when it comes to money, poor. Oh, and, you know, and I'm saying that's why we're doing financial aid as well. So it's something that we'll hopefully interact with more of you around that. Then I think just in closing, I trust that you are all going to be running the Run Your City on Sunday. That's the absolute Run Your City race taking place at Kings Beach. It's a quick 10Ks. There'll be a sprint for most of you. I'll be there to cheer you on. I hope to see you there. But it reminds me of the words of it says, It says, So the race doesn't always go to the fastest or the battle to the strongest. It goes on to say, But time and chance happen to all. And, and, and that's not just to say, as apostles, I then just give up because time and chance are going to happen. You can influence those chances. You can improve the chances. And I'm glad it talks about a race. Oh, I saw up a race. Because a couple of years back, it wasn't a running race. Uh, it was the Herald Cycle Tour. 
a lot of my mates were training for this, and there was a good bit of, uh, nothing like a bit of friendly rivalry going on. We even found some guys that were doing sneak training and had hired a professional trainer for themselves. We found this out afterwards. But one of my mates, at the lead up to the race, he had some hectic business demands, even an overseas trip. So come race day, he was way, way, way underprepared. And theoretically, the other guys should have had a much better race than him. But he finished 10 minutes ahead of his closest rival, his friendly rival. Why? Very simple. In cycling, there's this thing called drafting. You get into the right bunch, and if you get into the right group of cyclists, and you just sit on the guy in front of you, if you sit on his or her wheel, you can go 25, 30% faster than if you're cycling alone. So my mate who was unprepared happened to choose his bunch more strategically than the other guys. He got behind some guys who were training for Ironman World Champs and so on, and they were quite happy for him just to sit on their wheel, and, and they drafted him the whole way, crossed the finish line before the guys who were fitter and stronger. Then there are many lessons there. But the key one, what he did right, he chose his group very selectively. And in studying, be like the matter might choose your studying partners, choose your mates very strategically, choose people who are going to help you cross that finish line uh, much quicker. On those words, to Timaz and Natalia and Bola Gindlep, of course. Thank you so much. And there will be opportunity for financial education in Med Club later this year. And thank you very much for, for assisting with that. Yeah, we, we're not always very good with money, but we need to need to learn. Um, now is the time to say thank you. Um, and first of all, to our speaker, Prof. Flavia Senkobugi. Just a small token of appreciation and thank you for your words of wisdom and inspiration and that beautiful blessing. That was really wonderful. And, and I hope our students will carry it with them um, as, as you go through your careers. Then thank you to Prof. Singela for your words of wisdom as well. Prof. Singela will always remind us to look after ourselves and to look after our health. And we, we had portfolio reviews earlier in the week um, with the second years and talking about professionalism and one aspect of professionalism is, professionalism is also looking after your own health. And, and some of them said, yo, in first year that was really hard for me, but I'm becoming better at balancing work and having fun and having a social life. So I, I think your, your words of wisdom are inspiring our students as, as we go on. Then I need to say thank you to our acting director for leading our, our students in the pledge and for the organizing. There was a lot that went on behind the scenes. So um, Dr. Elizabeth Dutoy, Sherwin King, where is Sherwin? Um, is organizing. <laughs> And, and our wonderful support staff who are doing the recordings and, and the photos, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to APSA once again for, for being here and for, for sponsoring us. So afterwards, there will be some refreshments. Uh, but before that, we'd love to have a group photo on the steps. So please, yeah, the, this is the end of the, the formal occasion. We're going to take a photo of all of you and that will go into our records forever as the class of 23. And then there will be refreshments, I think, in the airport lounge. Us to do is please get up, students, all of us. <laughs> so uh, if you've got a phone in your hand, please put it down. Make, your, make sure your hands are free. And I want you to appreciate this moment. Remember, we said this is history. It's part of your personal history. So in order to make sure that this remains entrenched, you know, firmly in your mind, what I'd like you to do at the moment is put your hands up, both of them, high up, high up. Okay. And now that you've done that, I want you to clap in that position for yourselves to say, I made it. 